Tim Keller tells that same story, but he uses the folks of Tom and Joseph and Harry. Tom was a stock investor, and Tom was really good at it. He was young, he was aggressive, he was charismatic, and he made a lot of money. And he seemed to have the intuition of knowing when certain stocks were about to take off. And he made so much money. One day, he found out about some opportunities he had. And so he went to Joseph, who was an incredibly wealthy man. And he began to talk to him about an opportunity that, that he had. That if Joseph would loan him a large amount of money, he would invest it. Of course, Tom would make money. Joseph would make money as well. And so Joseph, well, you know, that's a large sum of money, but he thought, knew about Tom's reputation, so he loaned him this huge amount of money. Well, it wasn't long after this occurred that problems erupted. You see, Tom didn't tell Joseph everything about the companies that Joseph probably would have wanted to know. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made the investment. The companies were a little sketchy. They weren't on the best of foundations, and one of the companies failed. And what that did was everything that Tom had invested, the market turned against all of his investments, and he lost everything, everything he had, everything that he had borrowed. Well, Joseph knows about this, and he is not happy. You think about large, loaning a large sum of money to somebody to invest it for you, and then it's gone, right? It's vanished. And so Joseph's upset. He calls Tom. Tom can't pay this money back. Joseph, I've lost everything. Please, I beg for mercy. Please forgive me. And Joseph, Joseph not only forgave him, he forgave the debt. Tom, that's all right, okay? Don't worry about it. Good lesson for us to learn. I'm going to release you from that debt. Well, about the same time, remember, there's a third guy. There's Harry, right? While all of this is going on, Harry's life is spiraling out of control. I mean, Harry has gone through a horrible divorce. He's lost his wife. He's lost his child. He has lost everything, his home. And he's now staying in a rented, not apartment, he's staying in a rented room. And that's when Tom comes to Harry. Harry, you owe me $5,000. $5,000. Now, I'm not saying that's not a lot of money. It is, but for many of us, you know, hey, our our car loans started off bigger than 5000 We can pay that off. Harry tells Tom, Tom, you know what I've gone through. You know the difficulties that I've had. You know, if you just give me a little time, and Tom said, no, I want my money. But Tom, $5,000, that will wipe me out. I'll be on the street. And Tom didn't care. Give me my money. Well, Joseph found out about Tom. He's got new information. There's a new offense. And so Joseph comes back to Tom. Tom, didn't I, get, didn't I release you from a debt, a huge debt? Yes. And then how did you treat Harry? What do you think I'm going to do to you now? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call my lawyers back, and they're going to put in place that lawsuit that I had drawn up, and we're going to come after you. And we're going to, of course, bring out some correction and discipline in your life. Wow. A story about the cost of forgiveness and about how we should live our lives. Matthew chapter 18 is where we are. Verses 21 through 35. Peter has something to say here. He comes up with a great idea. And, you know, Peter's great ideas, Jesus always shows it could be better, Peter. And then he tells the story. Let's stand at the reading of God's word this morning from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. It says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. I know some of your translations may say 77 times or 70 times seven. I'll talk about that in a moment. Verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to the settlement a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. 
At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat you, each of you, unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You may be seated. We're going to talk at first about a story of forgiving and not. That's where we're going to start off this morning. It's an explanation of our passage. And then I want to talk about what forgiving is not. And so if we're going to talk about what forgiving is not, we want to talk about the next point about what forgiving is. And then we're going to find a way in our next point toward forgiving. And then we're going to come back. You know me, I want to tell another story, a forgiveness story, one that we know but we overlook too often. So a story of forgiving and not. That's what Jesus talked about, a story of forgiving and then not forgiving. A king had loaned out money to a servant, a huge amount of money. Tim Keller again estimates it at $400 billion. Now, that's four with a bunch of zeros behind it, all right? Now, I kind of have my head around what a million is. I know what two million is because two million is what I'm working on. I gave up on the first million, never get it. So I'm going to just, I heard the second million is easier to get, so I'm going to work and get that one instead. So anyway, a million, but if you take a billion and a hundred times, that's just a hundred million. And if you do a thousand times, that's just a billion. And we're talking 400 times that. And that just, you know, my brain just blows up at that. What $400 billion is, folks, is that is larger than 80% of the countries in this world, their gross domestic profit, their gross domestic product, should I say. Most of you have been to countries, many of you have been to countries that their gross domestic product is less than $400 billion. How much money is that? It's an amount of money that cannot be paid back. That's how much. Jesus is using exaggeration here. Don't try to figure out how this servant could have gotten into so much debt. That's not the point. The point is he couldn't pay it back. Please just give me time, he begged. I can give you a billion years and you won't be able to pay it back. But the king, he turned what had been an obligation became a defense to him, and he turned that into grace, and he released the debt. And so what is this servant who's been forgiven this astronomical grace and has been in the face of this magnanimous gift and generosity? He goes and he finds a servant who owes him a sizable amount of money, but it's an amount of money that can be paid back. Just given time, this other servant could pay him back. No, and he has him cast into prison. What's, what's this idea of prison? I mean, it's not like if you go to prison, you can really make it big in prison, okay? I mean, that's not the way it works. The way it worked was you'd be put in prison and you prayed that your family liked you because they're the ones that have got to pay you out of the debtor's prisons. And so that's how that worked, to be put in prison and get your debts paid off. A story of forgiveness by the king The story of not forgiving by the one who was forgiven. So let's look at what forgiving is not. And our society is very good at not forgiving. Some ways that we don't forgive. Forgiveness with no accountability. This is cheap or easy grace. You need to just move on. You need to get over it. And here's where I think I can use an example of our own denomination and the way that we have treated how individuals who've been sexually assaulted and who have been abused sexually in our denomination by pastors, by leaders, and the way that we have reacted, they have been told, you know what, you need to be forgiving. And this passage would be pointed out. You need to forgive. 
And of course, what about those who perpetrated the act, the sin? Nothing. Nothing. This is part of the, the entire culture about sexual assault and about sexual harassment. So often, it is the victim that is told, you need to forgive, and the victimizer is the one that gets off with nothing. And then that individual is now able to go and perpetrate more sin and more assaults. And at times, it can even turn into blame the victim. Well, what were you doing there? Why were you in that situation? This is not forgiveness, folks. Just getting over it. Forgiveness with no accountability. That's not forgiveness, and it doesn't work. Second way is that the perpetrator must earn his or her forgiveness. Once the perpetrator has gone through the gauntlet and has suffered enough so that the one who had been offended is able to say, okay, I'll release you now. Now we've turned forgiveness into just simply a transactional opportunity, a transaction that, hey, you know what, this will work. We can just agree that this is how it's going to have to be. But this opens up the door to extreme discipline, extreme punishment, and even to vengeance itself. It is not forgiveness. And then the last one that's not forgiveness is not forgiving. That's pretty easy to remember that one. No forgiveness. It is believed that there are some actions that people can do, that you and I can do, that are unforgivable. Maybe God can, but you know what? Not us. And usually when we think of these offenses, it's usually crimes against children. And I've heard people say this, you know, I could be gracious, but anybody that hurts a child, oh, that's just unforgivable. The problem with that, though, is, folks, as horrendous as it is, when we fail to forgive one person, we are dehumanizing that person. And when we dehumanize one person, we dehumanize everybody. It is not forgiveness. And yet, this is where our society finds itself, isn't it? A society that devalues forgiveness because it either has to be, merit, it has to be merited, you got to earn that forgiveness. And we see people groveling and trying to say, I'm sorry, and trying to make up for what the wrongs have been done. Or there's no forgiveness at all. If you want examples of that, just watch the political section of any news program. We don't forgive anymore because forgiveness is quickly becoming no longer a virtue. It is almost like a moral flaw in our lives. Folks, if we forgive, somehow we think that we will be diminished as a person, as a human, as an image bearer of God. But that's not the case. We need to forgive. And Keller, again, says that people may get away with their sins, but people cannot get away from their sins. It will always be there until forgiveness is extended. So then what is forgiveness? What does that look like? And if you sleep during my sermons, go to sleep real quick right now, all right? This is the part that, you know, I step on your toes. This is the hard part of the sermon. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness costs. Forgiveness costs the one who forgives. Now, listen to me. Forgiveness costs, and it costs a lot. Forgiveness is voluntarily stuff, suffering instead of retaliating against the one who has wronged you. You bear the cost. Peter knew this. Did you see what Peter did? He's coming up to Jesus, and he's wanting to know, where's the limit on forgiveness? Because he comes up and he says, Lord, I got the answer. Earlier in chapter 18, he's been talking about reconciliation in the church, and Peter goes, I know the answer. The Talmud had taught Peter, forgive three times, don't have to forgive four. But Peter knew his numbers, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is the complete number, the perfect number. Lord, should I be able to forgive seven times? Ooh, can you hear him kind of bragging, looking around at the other disciples? I came up with the right answer and y'all didn't. Ha ha, I got it first. I kind of have that image in my head. It's not in the Greek, but you know, it just is in my head. That's why I see Peter doing this. Lord, how much is it going to cost me? Seven? I can forgive seven. Eight? We got a problem, all right? We're going to have a real issue with eight. And Jesus, Jesus just really 
twists everything around with these numbers. Folks, it's not 77 times or 490 times. If you get mixed up with, well, which is it? 490 or 77, if you're doing that, you're missing the point. And I think this is one of those times in Scripture where I, I like that we really don't know the number because that's not the point. The point is this. You forgive and you keep forgiving and you don't stop. Seven times, Peter, it is perfection on perfection number of times. It's perfection multiplied by perfection. It's that you keep on going and you keep on forgiving and you don't stop. And, folks, that's hard. That's hard to do. I want to know when to quit. I probably haven't mowed as many lawns as many of you or most of you, but I tend to think I've mowed a lot of grass when I was growing up. We had a huge yard. It was wonderful to play in. My dad had just put some trees around the edge of the yard, and we, it was like a football field. It was like a baseball diamond. It was everything that we wanted for sports. But that grass... You know what grass does in the summer? It grows. It is horrible. It's terrible. It's nasty. It has to be. Dad wants it cut. But you know what I also knew? I knew that there was a fence. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I had to just mow up to the fence. I didn't have to mow the next yard in the next yard. There was a stopping point, all right? It's like whenever you get a new job. If you go to a new job, you want to know when you start, right? When, when do I start? What time do I need to get here? And you, need, you want to know what else? When do I get off, all right? Do I leave at 5? Is, is it a time clock or can I slide a little bit sometimes? You know, 4.50 is good enough, you know. When do I stop? And Jesus says there's no, there's no time clock here. It's not 8 hours a day, 40 hours a week. Forgiving is 24-7. Dana, you mow this yard, you got another yard to go mow now. You keep going. You keep on going. Forgiveness is something we live. It goes beyond something what we do. It's how we live. It's hard for me at times to grasp the depth of God's grace to me. And here's where my feet of clay, here's where my feet of clay show. I'm a sinner saved by God's grace, and I know you're a sinner saved by God's grace. But sometimes I think your sins are a little worse than my sins, and you needed more grace than I needed to get saved, all right? And when I do that, I cheapen God's grace in my life. And when I cheapen God's grace in my life, I can't extend forgiveness as well, can I? Folks, we need to learn the depths of God's grace in what he did to forgive us. Because we can't pay it back. $400 billion debt, that would be a bargain if that's what we owed God, but it's not. We owe him a life to be eternally separated from him, and I don't want to give that. So, of course, God gave his son Jesus to do that for us. Forgiveness cost, and it cost God too. So how do we get away toward forgiving? Let's look at this. Let's look at, uh, let's look at quickly at four things we can do. Let's... Uh, Let's name the debt, all right? Let's name the sin. Let's name the offense, okay? Let's be able to say, you know what? I was hurt by that. Now, a lot of us, you know, a lot of us who are married, we've learned to pick our battles, right? I mean, if, if I got upset about everything that upset me, I mean, whew, our marriage. Dear, believe me, I really don't tell you everything about I get upset about. I know it seems like I do, but I really don't, all right? And, you know, Kathy, the, the, the once every other year that she may get upset about what I do, you know, and she gets over most of those, but she may have to say something to me. We take a lot of those in. And that's fine because, you know what, hey, I just need to get over it, build the bridge and get over it. But sometimes when we're really offended, when we're really hurt, we need to name that, and it's okay. It's okay to say, you know what, that hurt. You hurt me. And I'm going to call that what it is. You've sinned against me, if you will. Don't make excuses for the person. Sometimes those in a position above us, we begin to make excuses. Oh, it's okay. They're under such pressure and everything. Just forgive them and move on. That's that move on. And we're back to that sexual assault issue again, right? 
And sometimes we can move those folks whenever we start naming that sin, we can start shoving them down beneath us, right? That's not where they belong either. But folks, it's all right that we need to name the debt. Don't pretend it doesn't hurt. Don't make excuses for the other person. Second thing we need to do is identify with the offender as a fellow sinner rather than focusing upon our differences. Because as you you already seen, you know what? The difference between my sins and your sins or my sins aren't as bad as your sins. Have y'all noticed that? I bet you probably have the same kind of sins in your life, right? Yours aren't as bad as mine. That's just human nature, I think, human sinful nature. But I have to identify with that person. That's what's hard. In the story of these three, the king, the master, the, the king and the servant and the lesser servant, we're supposed to identify with the servant who's forgiven everything and then yet is not forgiving. But we don't want to do that. We know that person's the bad person in the story. I don't, so you're going to be the rich person? Yeah, I want to be that, but, you know, I'll look at the bank account and that ain't me. And I'm not the one way down on the bottom, okay? Too often, I'm the one that isn't being merciful and isn't extending forgiveness the way I should. So identify with the offender. Identify who they are. They're sinners just like you are in need of God's grace. Third, release the wrongdoer and absorb the debt. Wow. Release the debt. Release that wrongdoer and absorb the debt. Now, it doesn't mean that you're ignorant about the past, okay? You take that with you. The you know, in the early story about, you know, Tom and Joseph, Joseph didn't have to forget that Tom wasted his money. Joseph could forget Tom, but it doesn't mean he's got to go back and invest with Tom again. That's Proverbs, that's wisdom, okay? Don't do that. But to release the wrongdoer means I can pray, I can pray to God for that person for what's best, all right? Not pray, Lord, vengeance is yours, and I'm going to give you some suggestions on what real good vengeance would be, all right? No, 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 well, that's, that's a little too harsh, okay? Keep praying. Let's, let's get it for their betterment, all right? Absorbing the debt means that you're going to work through the pain toward healing. And that's what we want. I want to be healed. I've been hurt, and what do I want when I've been hurt? I want to be healed, and then absorbing the debt does not mean the wrongdoer goes unpunished. Forgiveness doesn't subvert justice. I can forgive, but you still need to be disciplined or punished for what you've done. And then lastly, reconcile if possible. That's if possible. If you've been hurt by someone who has died, you can't reconcile. You can work toward it that as best as you can, but there's no reconciliation. If the person does not admit that they've done anything wrong, there's no reconciliation, right? You can't reconcile then. But if possible, you want to work toward a reconciliation of getting back together if you can. And it takes time and effort and it costs a lot, folks. But God's forgiveness of us costs a lot, too. Forgiveness story. We all need forgiveness. This church needs forgiveness. So often we think of ourselves as individuals, and so often in the Bible, the address is to the group, the corporate group. I mentioned our denomination. Our denomination needs forgiveness from God for what we as a denomination have allowed to take place. And we need to extend forgiveness because we have been forgiven. The story of Joseph is a great story. One of my first sermon series I ever preached was through the life of Joseph. I became an early version of AI, and I took a sermon series that Charles Swindoll preached, and I put it through my own AI processor, and I made it my own, all right? And I told the church what I did. Hey, I got this sermon series. I'm, I'm learning a lot from Charles Swindoll, and I want to share it with you. And the name of the sermon series was Bloom Where You're Planted. Isn't that an awesome sermon series? I mean, you know, wow, that's hot. 
I don't think I've preached that here. I need to do that here too, right? Bloom where you're planted. Whenever bad things happen, just blossom, just flourish in life. You're not going to get knocked down and stay down. You're going to get back up. And man, Joseph's story is awesome about that. You can preach a lot of sermons about that. Joseph's Joseph's story is also a story about how God takes what people did evil and sin, and God brought good out of it. Isn't that what Joseph's conclusion was? What you, my brothers, meant for evil, God meant for good. And look at how God is blessing us all now. What I've never heard is I've never heard a pastor give a series on forgiveness from the life of Joseph. But look at what hurts he went through. Now, I understand that he was a spoiled child, and he made sure his brothers knew how spoiled he was. Hey, guys, I got a new coat for Christmas. Work with me on it, okay? You know, yeah, they didn't have Christmas back then. But, hey, look at the new coat I got, all right? Yeah. And, you know, one of these days, you guys are all going to be bowing down to me because huh, it's me, right? And his brothers were mad. They sold him into slavery, didn't they? He winds up into Egypt. So he's mad at his brothers. Should, could be. And he winds up in Potiphar's house. She accuses him of something he didn't do, and Potiphar has to back his wife's story right, so he's been offended by Potiphar and his wife now. And then once he's in prison, some guys have a dream, and a cupbearer says, hey, interpret my dream, and he says, hey, you're going to be restored. And when you're restored, don't forget me. Only ask one thing, don't forget me. And what's the guy do? He forgets him for two years. Two years in prison. Hey, you want to spend two years in prison, you know, just to see what it's like, you know? No. No. You don't. And so what does Joseph do? He forgives. Doesn't, nothing about going against the cupbearer when he's put in a position above him. Nothing against Potiphar and his wife. Oh, my goodness. I mean, wow, the stories we could come up with on our own, but it's not there. The story of forgiving his brothers. Now, he went through the process. He checked, hey, are these the same guys? Can we reconcile? If they're the same guys, don't admit wrong. We got, you know, we can't reconcile. But they changed. They wouldn't turn against one another. Even if one had a little bit easier time than another did. No, we're not going to turn on one another. And Joseph forgave. And so, folks, the story of Joseph is this reminder of how we need to forgive those who have wronged us. And we can do that because God is at work in our lives. Folks, this morning, whatever you've done, it's not any worse than what anyone else has done. The person who's perpetrated the worst sins that you perhaps had ever heard of or imagined the same type of sin that I committed when I was just a five-year-old boy when I came to Jesus. There's no difference. Our debt to God was unpayable until Jesus came and paid it for us, paid it for you. Today's the day where you receive forgiveness, divine forgiveness. And we all remember, we've got in trouble, we did something wrong, and somebody in authority, a parent, a teacher, a principal, gave us grace in that relief we felt. This is divine forgiveness. Come and experience God's forgiveness in your life, and that will empower us as a church to forgive ourselves and to forgive others. What we're going to do is uh, I want to have you stand in a moment and pray. I'm going to call our praise team forward while I pray. We're going to sing a song, and I want to give you the opportunity to come forward. Come forward to receive Christ to ask for forgiveness, to come forward, to join the church, to come forward, to surrender to special ministry, to come forward just to pray with one of us. Because in a room in our church this size, there are people who are hurting, people who need to forgive, who need to be forgiven. Let's stand for our word of prayer. Lord God, as we come to you this day, sinners, weak and frail, and Lord, we come to you recognizing that you have paid the price for our sin. We come before you this morning with gratitude and with love for your generosity, and Lord, we ask that you would continue to change us to be forgiving people, and this day, most of all, 
those who have not experienced your forgiveness, have not tasted of its sweetness, that, Lord, you would bring them forward this day to receive that great salvation that you have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.